For the people who are learning to mind their business. Welcome to Mind Your Business. I am your host, Phil. Tug is out today. We have an exciting guest. We are here with the Atlanta Film Festival Executive Director, Cal Bowler. I fin- finally got your name right, right? That, perfect. There you go. Perfect. So, Collins, Dukembe, I'm learning. Yeah. Um, at least but, it's not Antetokounmpo or something like that. It could be way worse. Dude, having to spill Duke yeah. and Baby Mutombo is not the easiest That's true, though. That's true. It's uh, not easy. Yeah, and You're so right. I had to Google that one a few times. You're right. But uh, for those of you who don't know, Cal um, actually has a background in sports, which is why we think uh, he would make sense as a guest. Always talking about the intersection of kind of sports, music, and money. Um, so film, we'll just go with, you know, it kind of fits in there with music a little bit. Yep. Um, I think was the rule of thumb, like 10% or 20% of the film's budget goes to music or something like that. It's a, a lot it's of it for sure. Board. Yeah, absolutely. So y'all just, when I say just in April had the 43rd annual Atlanta yep. Film Festival. Yep. Um, I read some numbers y'all had, wow, more than 8,000 films submitted. Mm-hmm. Um, and... How many people did y'all have come out? 30, about 30,000 so, yep, people? Right around 30,000 people over 10 days. The way it's structured, we have it every spring, um, typically in April. Um, we receive submissions throughout the year from the end of the previous festival all the way up until about mid-November. Um, and that's and just so, because of the time it takes to actually view the films. Yeah, exactly. And we, we also you know want to give an ample amount of time for filmmakers to finish their works because there's, there's criteria where you, have, you can't submit an unfinished work. Um, it has got to be completed – which means you got to have all the editing done, all the shooting done, all of that stuff before you can submit, um, because they're you know they're screen ready basically when they, when they come to the festival. So we have it every spring. Um, we had over eight thousand submissions from one hundred and ten countries last year, um, which was really cool. And then we're set up over what was a the ten most day period. Country, because you're pretty international yourself. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's some they come from like some small countries, some African countries, some Indian countries. Like, I mean, there's there's just these little tiny countries all around that people, you know, are there filmmakers that are maybe just shooting stuff with a camcorder that they wow. found somewhere or whatever. But you you see a lot of interesting stories and a lot of a lot of really cool content. Um, How many I, years you been doing this now? I joined the board in 2016. Okay, so and I just I've been now a year. A little over. He just finished my year, first year, sort of um, at the top. So, how do you like it? I love it. It's great. It's great. You know, you interested you you know in, in coming in. You in, you mentioned you know kind of similarities between film and music and stuff like that. Well, interestingly enough, entertainment is entertainment, right? So professional yeah. sports kind of goes right into it. So professional sports, music, film, and television are all parallel lanes of the entertainment industry without question, and they also easily cross over. So that's what I want to know. How in the world did you end up at the film festival? So I fell into it, to be honest with you. Um, and then I learned that, you know, having a professional sports background really crossed over um, pretty easily. So um, actually someone that I was working with at the time um, with Comcast um, was actually on the board of directors. And we would end up around town at different events and stuff like that that, you know, were a little bit more exclusive. They weren't like open to the public type stuff. So you had to be invited in some kind of way or, or you know, have a connection to whatever the event was about. Um, and we would end up independently at some of these same events. So we got to talk in and became friends over time and ended up uh, that he was on the he was the chairman of the board for the film society. And, um, and so I just talked to him more and thought it would be something really cool that I'd like to get into. And and then there, you know, there became a, a position open. Um, and so it became a really easy fit for some of the reasons that I, I said, you know, the organization didn't have anybody with a professional sports background, um, yet the sort of relationships and all of, uh, my background in professional sports and everything that came with it was really easy to transfer from people that I know in hospitality, um, corporate partner sponsorship weird, right? opportunities. Every, like you everybody, really, everybody cross. You, it really does, like, right? So, that. so athletes don't make good rappers typically, and actors, Shaq. actors, right? Exactly, and you know, rappers want to be athletes, and actors want to be athletes, or you know, like everybody wants to be the other Someone one. Else, that yeah. crossover doesn't really do well typically, but on the business side, ludicrous. Uh, the yeah, there you go. He turned well, a pretty good. He's actor. got more acting credits and made more money in in film than he has did, in music. No kidding. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. He's got more credits in film than. That's nuts, man. Yeah. So but that's that's kind of the thing, too. though. Ti's got almost eighty film film and TV credits. No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah. That's pretty. All right. So yeah. I mean, so that. So I, I mean, like stuff that may you may never have seen or whatever, but you still get credit for something that you've done that's actually gone to market. Yeah. 
So same way. So you, one thing I thought was pretty interesting uh, that we asked you out there, but I'll get you to explain it for our listeners. What makes people want to bring a film to a film festival? So, you know, I always just think big, what do you call it, big budget films? Sure, I yeah. mean, that's kind of all I know, yep. um, looking from the outside. Yep. And so I always think like, oh, you know, Marvel has, they already got their distributor. They yep. and they line everything up before they even, that's right. you know, cut a check to anyone. Right. And so how, do, how does this, how does the film festival fit in in that world? So that's a great question. So the type of films you're talking about make up maybe 1% of all the films that are made in any, at any given time. So the stuff that you see on the big screen, if you go to a Regal or AMC theater, um, all, any big blockbuster that you see throughout the year, if you were to take a look back over the year and counted how many of those there were, there's really not that many in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, Most of the films are low budget or indie films um, from filmmakers around the world because now, especially nowadays, anybody can make a film with their phone or because you know cameras are pretty good. So if you're interested in film, you can do that. You can find editing software and you can put together a, a, a really good film. Now, it's not the same quality, right, as, as what the big blockbuster films would have because of the budget they have behind them to do all that stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, you've got an opportunity to tell a story. You've got an opportunity to, to present it the way you want it presented. And most of filmmaking really occurs at, at that lower budget and, and below level, which is the great thing about film festivals. It gives an opportunity for those independent artists and filmmakers to really – have a place to showcase their work. So it's publicity and the networking. So absolutely, yeah, it's both. It's both. You know, you want to, you know, you want to submit to to different film festivals and try to make, you know, what we refer to as the as the festival circuit. So you get visibility, you build some more grassroots marketing without having to spend a ton of just outright TV dollars or whatever, um, and get some momentum behind. And at the same time, get some industry eyeballs on you because you want industry eyeballs, whether it be, you know, uh, talent or distributors or production companies or whatever it may be. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a great way to sort of effectively and efficiently as possible, um, build a name for yourself, your film, you know, build your reputation, lay eyeballs on whatever your work may be, um, and win some awards, you know, and, and build some credibility. And y'all had some big names out. I saw Lulu Wang came. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was great. She was awesome. Yeah. Is she, how, what, what's she like? One on, did you get she any one-on-one awesome. time? With yeah. Her? She, you know, she was great. She actually was our, uh, in our opening night film. Um, and, you know, she was, she was, was it flawless, I think, or start with an F uh, the farewell farewell. Yeah. And she was coming, you know, fresh off crazy rich Asians, which was a huge success. Right. Yeah. I don't think anybody, I think, I think that really opened up Hollywood's eye, really just, um, the American economy's eyes to the Asian consumer. No doubt. No doubt. Which, you know, if you Asian tie American that back consumer. into sports, right. To the, the Asian community in sports is the biggest NBA, uh, fan base. I think Yao Ming woke him up to that. Yep. When, I said, well, I think they knew before, but I think, cause what was it? Yao Ming's Jersey was like number one every year. Every right? year. Yeah. Cause it's China in China, the whole yep. country's buying Yao Ming jerseys. Yep. That's right. And so that's a huge, the Asian market in, in all of entertainment. Again, you can lump sports in that with music and TV. The Asian market is without question. K-pop and music. Just, uh, yeah, yeah that's K-pop's right. taking over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's even you, we got American kids going to K-pop concerts. Yep. We can understand a single word. Not a single word. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's 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 amazing. And and so she she did a great job of parlaying, you know, the Crazy Rich Asian success, success of that film into to more films. Um, and she was great. She actually came and um, she was one of our opening night films. And she came to our opening night party and stayed after and said hello. You know, said hello to fans coming up and. Took pictures and stuff. She was awesome. Can most so I know in music a lot of musicians don't ever want to hear their work. Yeah, kind of like a writer because you're always like, man, I could have done better. Right. Like I should I should have changed that word. Right. Out. Are, are directors that way? So typically, what happens when the talent, whether it be director, writer, or or on actor. screen actor, whatever, when we're when they're doing a screening, they'll come in and maybe do a little intro for the film. The film will kick off and then they'll leave and go do whatever. Because they're maybe so valuable, be hosted yeah. and go to dinner or you know, go have a meeting or something like that. And then when it's over, then they'll come back in and do like a Q and a or something like that, a little meet and greet or something like that. So you don't typically see them sit and watch their own film. I'm sure they've seen, they've it, seen it enough. enough right. Yeah. Um, and then I guess if you're an artist, you don't really want to sit there and listen to what a crowd of people might say, Oh, the, you know, yeah. like if it's great, then that'd be great. Oh, is but there, if do it's people not, get their critiques. Well, I mean, if you're, if you're just in a, in a, you know, an audit a film auditorium, you know, you're at a, in a movie theater and you're watching this film so yeah, whether you came in through a festival or not, you know, you might hear murmurs or whatever. Or mm, gotcha. Maybe when you thought there was something really funny and nobody laughed, you're like, oh, man, well, you know. Yeah. So 
So what what are the most looking forward? Well, I guess looking back, what was your favorite movie out of the festival? Are you are you allowed to choose one? Uh, you know what, man, it's interesting because or can you not even really watch it because you're working the whole time? I mean, I see as many as I can, but that's not many. I mean, we we screened over ten days. We screened ninety films, like all over the city oh, but, and different but plaza, venues. Plaza yep. theaters, like plaza the theaters are sort of our headquarters, especially where our major, or, you know, our bigger films play. So but we if, also you, use if you've other... never been to Plaza Theater, go check it out. It's super cool. It's like a throwback. I don't know. It's kind of retro. I don't know how to yeah. describe it. But. It's incredible, man. I, in this month, actually, the month of July was an incredible time to go down because um, they did the twenty-five years of Bond. So oh, cool. every day in July up to 25 they played all the bomb movies from dr no in 1962 all the way through and i think this is the last week they got a couple more in honor of the 25th bond that's coming out what's the what's the really weird movie that like um it's a like, name like the weirdest like famous movie that there is it came out in, like the 80s maybe 70s i keep wanting to say clockwork orange but it's not that uh um, great like, question like Actually. people people like watch it like in the theaters yeah. they still screen it on like saturday nights and yeah. people will like dress rocky up. horror that's it yeah, yeah, yeah they still do that yeah at, yeah, yeah. At the friday nights at midnight have you ever been there to one friday of this i haven't been my daughter actually goes though my daughter she's 17 Are they, she goes it a cool? lot it's cool they do just like the just like you know the, the classic show they've got real you know they got real actors in there and the movies playing and they got the the actual i've heard know, it's cool i gotta check that out i haven't seen it i've heard it's awesome my daughter loves it she goes Probably five or six times so a year. So what part of town do you live in? If she's if she's going there, I live down. So we live in we live in like Morningside, Virginia Highlands cool. area. Yeah. So not that maybe maybe three miles from Plaza Theater. Yeah, if that's cool. That, she's grown up in the city. Street. So yeah, it's great. I love it down there, and it's great for you know for what I do. So so I saw we were, I was looking through your Wikipedia profile, and I saw <laughs> you were a retired Irish American basketball player, and then you said you actually played for the Irish national team i did so, so yeah tell us about that yeah so after my years in here in atlanta with the hawks um when it came time to me to start exploring going overseas um my grandfather on my mom's side was born in belfast and lived there until he was a teenager before he came over to the united states ireland is one of the few countries that will allow you to get citizenship if you're a generation removed so most require that your parents be born there and live a significant amount of time, whatever that may be, into teen years or whatever, in order for the kids to qualify for citizenship. In, in the case of Ireland, you actually can be a grandparent generation to apply. So we found that out and you know, I went through all the application process and were able to dig up all of the required documentation and was able to get a passport. So I do sit here as a dual citizen. So what does that get you? Man. So in terms of playing basketball internationally. I guess it helps with taxes, right? Well, it, not only that, it helps with, you know, the structure of the team. So the teams, when you're playing on the bigger teams in particular, are restricted to how many players they can have from different places. you got to have a, let's say if you're playing in Italian or Spanish league, you, have, you have to have a certain number of, of Italians or Spanish team on usually at least half of the team has got to be. That makes sense. Just country, country, not all country American players, basketball right. players. Then you've got a certain number of inner of uh, European Union players you can have. So maybe you have if you have a roster of twelve, then maybe you have to have six uh six, you know, national born players to be Italian or Spanish if you're in one of those leagues. And then four European Union players um gives you ten. Then you can have two players from somewhere outside of European Union. So it could be the United States, it could be Russia, it could be Eastern Bloc, it could be Anywhere else that wouldn't qualify under the MAC criteria, and those, you have to be a U two fan to get dual citizenship in Ireland. I, I think it just comes with it. You, yeah. It was a space on the application that I think they throw out if you say no. They they throw it out instantly. Dude, have you ever seen a video of you know Edge, right? Yep. So have you ever seen a video of or a picture of his recording studio? Uh uh-uh. uh so What's the? Uh, go ahead and troll me, but I forget the main river that goes right through Dublin. Um, but whatever that is, his studio is literally like water level with yep. it. Nice. So, so like when he's like look at like he's like below the water yep. somehow. I don't understand how that engineering works, but it's just like that's cool. If you're gonna sit there and record, that's that's, that's the cool. Place to do it. You know, that's funny. There's China. We were talking about China earlier. China is building a little city about an hour outside of Shanghai, um, and it's actually up and running. It's continuing to be developed, and it's a it's a film and music hub. And they've they they're building studios, they're building like uh, research and development sets and stuff for virtual reality and augmented reality and animation and all of the different stuff that comes with. But they've built a little all inclusive city with hotels and restaurants and stuff like that. One of the things you said underwater is reminding me. 
they they built a studio that's underwater in like the central lake that's kind of inside this whole complex. They built a studio underneath that lake with views of the water. So like if you're shooting like like an underwater scene? Mm -hmm. (laughs) China, man. China's taking over the world. There's no no question. So uh, there's a little crossover, Space Jam. The new Space Jam. That's got to be right up your alley, man. It's Coming out. Yeah. About basketball. Totally. Did, was the first Space Jam, I guess you were, how, how so old were you? So I would have been in. Like right in college or at that point. I was, uh, I was probably in high school, actually, because that would have been, well, what was that, mid-90s? Yeah, it was probably like 90, I'll, I'll say 95. Now, yeah, yeah. So like that would have been right on my either coming out of high school or end of, and I graduated from high school in 95. So it was either in high school or just early early college. Did you watch it or was it too much of a little kid's movie? No, I watched it. I so being a basketball was, guy? it was cool, yeah. Will you take your family to go see cool. the new one? Nah, probably not. Will, no. we, will we get the premiere at the Atlanta Film Festival? We won't because the timing won't probably won't work out, right? So they'll they'll have they'll have it done prior to. We had Dave Watson on mm-hmm. uh, on our show, so you're the second Comcast employee and we're going to get uh, Bill Connors one day, I promise. Nice. But I want to know what you do at Comcast. They're, you know, their the regional headquarters is right across the way here at the yeah. Battery. Yeah. So, um, so interestingly enough, um, when I when I retired and stopped playing, um, you know, I like most players, right? Or your most athletes or whatever post post job, you got to figure out, you know, what the next your time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I actually came down here and worked in the front office for the Hawks um, when I was when I was first retired in corporate sales. So I was selling season tickets and suites and stuff like that. So I was there for a year, and then based on some of the relationships I met there, actually a good friend of mine. Um, was working for HBO and hosted Comcast in a suite one night. And so I was there just hanging out in the suite with them, met a lot of great folks. Uh, Dave was not there, um, but, you know, some of the core Comcast group was. Um, And later, about another year later, they were starting a new department um, that was targeting specifically, and this has nothing to do with entertainment whatsoever, um, but I just kind of, they asked me to come do it, so I did it. So we started a department that over, that worked with, builders and developers for single family home subdivisions and neighborhoods and stuff like that. So if you live in an area like this or most areas, you see this explosion of these, you know, 100 and 200 home uh, subdivisions that go up all over the city. Yeah. You know, you have three or four or five maybe footprints of, of homes, but they all basically look the same, you know, all over. Um, and so we created a department that specifically worked directly with those builders to identify what those projects were and monitor the timelines of development and then be the liaison between those external partners and all of the internal department departments that it takes to put together, making sure that the infrastructure gets put in from construction to actual, um, you know, the technical side of getting all of the equipment set up and then all the way to the sales side for actually getting customers signed up. So it's a lot, that's a lot, you have your hands in a lot of different things. What'd you study so, in college? So, <laughs> so in college, I got my, uh, I got management my, or something? got my degree in sports medicine. Um, but then I ended up getting drafted. So I played and you know, all of that kind of went out the window. So I didn't really have any, I didn't really have any interest by the time I was done playing to get back into that. Um, and so, so you just kind of picked it up on the I just kind of, yeah. I mean, I just kind of, yeah, picked it up. I mean, I don't even really know. Didn't have a affinity. For, it's kind of like the film thing. Like I didn't have any background in any of it. I just sort of doors just kind of opened. Oh, it's like you see CEOs, man. It's like the, the industry doesn't nearly matter as much as building a team mm-hmm. and managing people. That's right. So um, and Comcast is great, man. It's a great place to work. It's a great company. I always forget how massive it is. It's huge. It's a Fortune 50 it, company. I yeah. Mean, like, you but know, I'm like, they, hey, do you know my cousin? You're like, no, nah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like there, yeah. there's like a thousand. Well, no, that's right. And that's just that, yeah, that's just in Atlanta. In but if you think you think a lot of people don't realize too, but Comcast, you know, owns. Universal, they own NBC, they own uh, minority stake in Hulu, and about Sky TV too, right? S- just just recently picked up Sky. Yeah, so Sky's um, a big uh, network in Europe. Yep, yep. It's so, UK based, right? Yep, it's UK based, but it covers it's it covers all of Europe, though. I mean, like it's it's, it's kind of like they're seeing, significant. It's, almost, it's so they're battling the BBC in terms of like uh, content. Well, it's not just a network like. though; they're also a provider. So it's not just wow. like we're NBC or or you know CNN or BBC or networks. Their Sky is also a provider like Comcast is. Wow. So it's where Comcast. So owns they're creating Sky. the content and distributing it. Yeah. So they're that's, well, that's they're not creating the content. 
They're, well, well Sky, they are. Sky yeah, News, so Sky, right? yeah, so Sky News and the Sky Networks are creating the content, yes. Okay. Um, but the, so the overall company is, is the one that's also supplying the infrastructure and actually putting the system out in addition to the content creation. So I want to fanboy out a little bit and talk about your basketball. Yeah, man. So your first-round pick, yep. number 17th overall. Yep. Did you, did you see that coming? So interestingly enough, um, I by the time I had a I had a really good senior year, and I came from Old Dominion University. Um, so at that time, you know, definitely a mid major school for sure. There wasn't as much TV access as there is now. Um, definitely no social media access and stuff like that. So um, I had to make the most of some some of the marquee matchups we had when we played teams like Carolina and some of the bigger games. Um, so by the time I came into my senior year, so players are thinking about this when they're in college. You have to be, you know, if you if you're if you're on a radar in some kind of way where you you know you you potentially can really have a you know have a realistic opportunity to play, then you have to be. You know the big game. You have are, to know what the market is. You have to understand sort of where you fit and what what the opportunities are. So like now, kids are looking at it differently, right? They they need to have visibility social media wise because the, the teams have scouts that are scouring you know YouTube and social media. They got to have certain you know camps they got to go to and all this. so you have to you do have to be aware for sure there's also a whole lot more tv now even for the smaller schools so was it's aau a, you know, a big thing when you were growing up aau was really starting to become big it's not it was nothing like it is now um but i definitely played um i'm from virginia originally and i played for boo williams who boo williams is one of the i would say it, in terms of aau and how it goes definitely one of the more legendary names yeah, he's like a bear um, Bryant. throughout that yeah exactly yeah. Um, so I did play for Boo Williams um, for two years, so the summer before my junior year and the summer before my senior year. He's not still alive, is he? Um, he is, actually. No kidding. He is, yeah. You still talk to him? He is. So I haven't talked to him in a while, but I saw a buddy of mine was uh How was, many was NBA players do you think so. he's coached over his career? A lot. More than he can count? A lot. There's no question. That's cool. There's no question. So so I, I had the privilege of being a player on one of those teams, so he definitely was you know, looked at as an elite. It was an elite team. We traveled. Um, whereas now everybody travels, right? You just try yeah. to scurry up sponsors and stuff and everybody kind of travels, but for sure we were on, the, on an elite team, but you know, I ended up, uh, getting, getting drafted 17th overall. I had so like, really are, great workouts. Like, did the Hawks call you the day before? They're like, Hey, if you're on the board, we're grabbing you. Nope. So how, is, literally nope. you're sitting there yep. just like, so I had, I went, I played in the pre-draft camps leading up to the draft and played really, really well. And which would be, you know, against your peers. Um, so I played really, really well, like stand out well in those pre, pre-draft camps. And that led to individual workouts with probably 20 teams out of 30. Um, and then all my workouts went stressful? really well. I mean. Because you know 100% everything I guess it, you're doing is getting critiqued. It, it could be, yeah. I mean, it, it can be for sure because it's a small environment. Everybody's sitting there with clipboards. Like it can <laughs> Judging be, right? one yeah, person. It can be for sure. Um, but all my workouts went went really well. Um and so, sort of the ram- the rumblings, you know, before the draft was that I, I would, I, I could and should be somewhere in the late first round, probably in the twenties, um, and be- mainly, well, not mainly, but because there were uh, Utah had three picks in the in the twenties, Houston had two picks in the twenties, and the Pacers had three picks in the twenties, and so those clubs alone having that many picks, I would have fit in really well. Um, Atlanta ended up taking me 17th overall, um, and which obviously turned out great and was a great, great place to be. So it was a little earlier than I thought, um, but I think by the time we got to draft time, it was I was projected to be a first round pick for sure. So, you, so after you get drafted, mm-hmm. you're what eight, you're 18 at this point? No, you were probably 20. No, at this I, point. I went all four years. Yeah, so you're so 20, I was, 22 at this I point was, probably. Uh, I was 22. So at the youngest, what kids? You can be 19, I guess, and go to the league. Yeah, now. Um, so what in the heck is that feeling when you're, you know, you've probably never really been, you never really been on your own before, right? Yeah. You know, cause you get to, I'm sure old dominion and colleges, they understand you're coming from mom and dad yeah. and they're going to make that transition. How does, how did the NBA teams help you transit? Do they understand that? Are they like, look, this kid's out of, this is a kid still like, you know, we need to look, we, we, you're going to move to Atlanta. We're going to help you set up. Like, how does all that work on just getting you to the city, telling you show up on Monday, like. So I think it's difficult for the team to sort of micromanage that. So they just um, kind of like – The league itself had a lot of great programs that summer, the sort of preparatory sump, uh, preparatory programs during the, the, the camps um, that we all went through to, to, to help with some of that stuff. Um, the team does have people in place to make sure you know where you're supposed to be 
and and you know they'll send out like a mass schedule and you know but then they'll tell you somebody will contact you every single day and say hey practices here don't be late practices you know so there's like a still, team manager that's right, kind of their so they job. still they'll still do that kind of thing which is definitely sort of more college to a you know and then to a point once you get you know once you get a couple of years in and they don't really mess with you as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do um i think the biggest transition is not only just being on your own maybe for the first time where you actually have your own house and all that stuff but it's also having the amount of money that you have yeah totally and the access to things that you all of a sudden have um, because you may have been a big star in college, you may have been a great player, but when you step into an international stage with a really large amount of money in your pocket, you know every door in the world is all of a sudden open to you. So it's more than just, oh, I got my first apartment on my own, or I bought my first house on my own, or whatever. And so there's a whole lot more to it. Um, and so it's very difficult, really, for the teams or the league to kind of manage each individual player and how they respond to that. Um, so you do have to have a good support system around you for sure because it's really easy to kind of get swallowed up. One thing I think is fascinating, tell us, how did you select an agent the first time? So that's a, that's a great question. So I, um, <laughs> so I sort of took some sort of basketball royalty uh, recommendation. Um, so I was actually working a five-star uh, camp when I was in college, um, summer – remember summer before my junior year summer must have been summer before my senior year um and Howard Garfinkel I'm sure you're you're familiar with five-star basketball camps yeah. maybe you're not but five-star well, basketball heard, camps too much, but yeah. so five-star basketball camps were the elite basketball camps that then stemmed Nike and Adidas and all of the you know prestigious camps that came after that and then what it's blossomed into now five-star five-star was the camp to go every single blue chip blue chip basketball player that was in the NBA, went through this camp un- until you started seeing invitation Nike only? and Adidas. Yeah, invitation only. Um, well, they had different levels. They did have some just pay to go, but they had their elite camps were invitation only. And, like, all the great players went, all of them, up until you started getting Nike and Adidas, and it started becoming a little bit more money. Um, Howard Garfinkel, um, who is now since passed away, but Howard Garfinkel is the one that started it. He's out of New York, started it, developed it, curated it some kind of way. I don't even know. Um, but he's without question basketball royalty. Um, so I was there working one of his camps and had become very close with him. And he and he pulled me to the side and he said, "Look, I got somebody you need to meet." And he called he called the his you know number one guy we'll call it um, and had him come up to Pittsburgh, which is where the the camps were. Um, and uh, and then we just kind of met, and talked, we hit it off. I went through my senior year. Circle back around. I took some interviews with other companies, um, and then ended up falling back. So you did chop around, around. yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to still talk to, but it, I, I really liked my agent. Um, it was a small boutique operation out of Washington D.C. Um, they represented Nick Anderson, um, Dennis Rodman for a little while, um, a whole host of of you know great players that weren't Michael Jordan level players, but they were also great long tenured players. Did you ever going to meet Dennis Rodman? Um, I didn't actually. They didn't represent him at the time when I started playing. Um, it was early on in his career, I think, before things started to go sideways. What do you think about his trips to North Korea? Um, I, I think it's awesome. I, mean, I think it's, any dialogue is good. It's interesting, right? For sure. I mean, if you, I mean, it may be lo- he may be looked at poorly for those decisions from you know from an American perspective, but at the same time, to your point, just being able to have any dialogue that dialogue. type of interaction yeah. and sort of soften the walls on that side has, has dude, to help in some kind of way. And the stuff he's right? gotten away with. So I heard that he got over there. You know, he's got a drinking problem now, mm-hmm. and uh, so he's drinking and he stands up and gives a toast, and he's like, uh, I forget what the new leaders call, but we'll call him. Is it Kim Jong Un? Yeah, I think so. Um, and so he's like, "Your dad did a lot of effed up s," uh-huh. and he's like. But you're trying to change all that, yeah, and it's just go. like, oh my god, dude! Yeah, like yeah. you're gonna you're gonna go to jail. Well, obviously this yeah. wasn't filmed, right? But they said uh, Kim Jong Un just like lit up, started yeah. smiling, and yeah. was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's just it's, so I, I think I mean, people, yeah, people get mad about Rodman, but it's like and this is what people don't get about sports music and film too, mm-hmm. man. Culture breaks down walls, like, absolutely. And so people need to understand Rodman, crazy or not, he had the unique ability. Of he was a basketball player. Mm-hmm. Kim Jong Un's a hardcore basketball fan. Yep, take advantage of that. That's I think, right. I think it's brilliant. Um, who were who were some of the players that you got to play with? Were you ever starstruck on court? Like, oh man, there's Michael Jordan. So you know, it's funny. I was Jordan in the league still. Washington. So he was with the Wizards okay. when I was playing. So I got to 
my, I guess my real starstruck moment was with Jordan was when I was in college and I was working some of his camps in Chicago in the summertime, and he would come and play with the, in the counselor games at night after the camp was fun. over just to play. That was amazing. I mean, like that 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 was amazing because he was. People forget how massive Michael Jordan was. I mean, amazing. Um, He's like my, the Michael Jackson of sports. There's no question, and his lifestyle would suck. I mean, like having to live the way he had to live, like just kind the way being, he had to move around and yeah, stuff. Like was, almost like, you're almost like people forget. Like it when was, you reach that level, you're like a hermit. Yeah, because it, it so many bad. people come are coming at you with the wrong. You know, yeah. he had motive. to sneak everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. Yeah, it, it couldn't have been fun. But anyway, it was that was incredible to be able to play with him, like in that sort of casual environment for sure. Um, and then by the time I got to the league, he had sort of retired and come back and gone to the Wizards, and he was with the Wizards, and he still was great. Still was great, but he wasn't the same Michael Jordan as as he was before. But one and and you know most people think, oh, Shaq was my favorite player, my idol, or whatever. Interestingly enough, like Tony Kukoc was my favorite yeah. player growing up because we were very similar in the way that we played and similar in stature, about the same size. And was he the Bulls the whole his whole career? No. So I actually got a chance to play with him here, which was awesome to be able to Wait, play with someone. Who played here? He did. So well, after Chicago, midway through my. Second year, so after Chicago, he was right? part of the trade that sent Dikembe to Philly and brought uh, – who did it bring? Tony came and coach was, he, Theo he, Ratliff came. He was the one who hit the game-winning jump shot. Yeah. Okay, he did play for the Bulls, though, right? He did. He okay. played for the Bulls most yeah. of all of his – I was about to say, I'm like – 10 years maybe or more. Yeah, right. Okay, so gotcha. it was at the end of his career is when he started. So he came here and played for two years, I guess. Um, so I got a chance to play with him, which was awesome. And then I think he went to Milwaukee – I think he still lives outside Chicago. So you are you on you're you're still involved with the Hawks. You're on the D- Diversity and Inclusion Council. Yeah, so I do a lot of stuff with the Hawks. So I do a lot of I speak at camps during the summertime. Um, do a lot of partnership events and stuff like that. I go to a ton. Of, I think I went to 35 games last year. 35 no home games. Yeah, so I try to go to as many games as I can. Um, yep, I sit on the board for the Diversity and Inclusion Council that they created, which is awesome. So we had Mitt in here. Mitt, you know, Mitch Shaw. Uh-huh. He's a co-owner yeah. of the Hawks. You know this, but our yeah. listeners probably don't. Um, and I asked him, I'm like, hey, man, if you wanted to, could you just go in the locker room after a game? And he's like, I mean, yeah, I probably could, but I don't. Right. What about you? You're a former player. No. So, I mean, they keep it very, very closed in to just the core group. Um, if you're Dikembe, maybe you can go in, right? Or Grant Hill can go in there. Um, but, well, Grant, you know, Grant's it's also just an owner, a, though. Of course. But just, you know, for for the core, you know, so just sort of former players, you're not just wandering around in and out of the locker room, especially on game day. Or but, like, like, they that, would no. literally say, like, no. They would frown upon it. I mean, like, I you could probably get in just by knowing the security people and stuff like that. But then if you got inside there, then people would kind of be looking at you sideways, like, "What are Come you on, doing man. in here?" Yeah, and, you know. Come on, dude. Yeah. And then one time like that, and then, then all of a sudden you get a strike against you, and then they start, you know, then you, you start, start, start yeah, start watching. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So it's the same way for media. Yeah. Uh, you, like we'll take advantage of getting there, mm-hmm. but you can't ever overdo it. Yep. Exactly. Um, it's exactly the same thing. And, it, and the Hawks have a great alumni program too. I mean, like they provide all kinds of opportunities, you know, for us to be a part of the the organization in some kind of way, whether it's camps or the partnership events or whatever. Um, they give us tickets to the games if we want to, you know, whenever we want to come and stuff. So they do a great job um, supporting the the former players. Too. So what made you make Atlanta your forever home? Well, I'll be honest with you, I fell into it. Just kind of like everything, you know, we've talked about so far. I came down here f- to take the job with the Hawks. Came down here, bought a house like, probably or something like that's that. What I, yeah, that's exactly, you know, I came down, got took the job with the Hawks, which is why I came down here it's, for it's, that that's, job. That's funny. Yeah. It's, and oh, then, you mean you took the job with the Hawks in the front office? The front, I thought, yeah, yeah, I thought yeah, you no. meant like getting no, took, so from, I left. took the yeah, job yeah, on court. No, so I, when I came and got – when I got drafted, then after three years, I ended up going overseas. So by the time I was done playing – I went back to Virginia initially, which is where I'm from. I had a house there and all that. Overseas, are you as big a celebrity as here? No, soccer's big there. Like soccer, the biggest, the biggest basketball celebrity in Europe is not even close to the mid level soccer guy. That's like what it's a whole different different world. It's a whole nother, whole nother thing. Now in, in Asia, it's different. Basketball Did you play players are guys. I didn't, but basketball players in Asia and in, in now. In Asia, are so you played in what? Italy? You played in Italy, right? I played all three years. I played in Italy. Oh, um, cool. I played on Euroleague teams that that so I traveled all over the place. But I've only played in the. I was only based in the Italian league. Was that awesome? It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, getting paid to live was, in Italy. Has it to was be amazing. Cool. And I mean, you know, when you're on travel teams, I probably was able to go to thirty countries. And you, and there and I feel like teams are pretty good about like scheduling events and stuff, like letting you like see the city. So you like, do have some flexibility. One one thing that gives you some of that flexibility is you don't have any private planes. 
So you fly commercial. So your travel schedule wraps around, you know, when you can get flights and stuff. So like in the NBA, everybody has a private plane. So as soon as the game's over, you go to the you you go to the airport and you get on the plane. And you either go home or you go to the next city. So you're not get necessarily getting a lot of extra time in any one place. Yeah, where, no culture. You know, one game in Spain may you may be there three days if you fly in in the morning the day before. You have practice. You have that day. You have game the next day. And then the following day, you don't fly out until the afternoon. You end up having some some time to kind of spend just going around and, and checking things out. Um, so that was pretty cool. And the other thing, too, about Europe that's interesting is that, you know, the countries are the size of medium size or smaller states. But what's very different there is that as soon as you cross borders, you have a whole different culture. So it's not like driving from Georgia to North Carolina or from, you know, Virginia to Tennessee. Yeah. You know, like the, there's not a big cultural difference when you make those. But when you're driving from Italy to Switzerland or from Switzerland to France or from Italy to Macedonia or Austria. That is weird or, to think about. You know, like the cultures are totally different. Yeah, I wonder why. My favorite place to live was my third year in northern Italy in a small little town called uh, Varese. Varese was How about. Small? Uh, I don't know what the population was, but it wasn't much. I mean, like it was like, small, small. Uh, under right? a million? No, no, no. Like. 20,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. But they have a professional sports team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I mean, there's there's teams all over, like all the little, you know, communities and towns. It's, it's different. So, I mean, there there were probably 15, 15 teams in the Italian league. Oh, so, cool. when you're on your league teams, you play two – you play almost play like two separate leagues. You play in, in your home country league. So, in my case, it would be an Italian league. You play one game a week. And you play one game a week in the Euro league. But it's your same team. You're just playing either Italian teams or European. other Euro league teams. Yeah. So, you know, 15 cities, to have 15 teams in Italy, there's not that many big cities. So, you know, there mo- a lot most of them are in smaller places. But in, in this particular small town was sat at the base of the Italian Alps. It was about a 30-minute drive to Milan, and it was about a 30-minute drive to Lugano, Switzerland. So, I could have play my game or practice or whatever. I could go to have lunch in Switzerland. Or I could go out at night and be part of the, you know, one of the best fashion scenes in the world in Milan on on a weekend. That's awesome. Something about, right? Within a 30-minute drive one way or the yeah, other, right, I could yeah. be having lunch on the lakeside with ice cap mountains. Or, you know, I could be popping bottles with models on in Milan. Or in a three-hour drive, I could be in Zurich. Three-and-a-half-hour drive, I could be in Monte Carlo. Four-hour drive, I could how, be in how French Riviera. Three years? I was in Italy for three years. I only lived there for one year. Did you pick up any Italian? I spoke it enough. I should have put some effort into it to really speak it. I could speak it well enough to have a conversation and get I didn't speak it Order for grammatically you, get correct. Cab. Yeah, exactly. I didn't speak it grammatically correct, but, but we don't speak English okay. grammatically correct. That's right, Who exactly cares? right. So or, it was You're similar. not American if you're not screwing up it was a language. Similar. But it was easy also not to pick up the language that well because the, in the basketball world, the number one language was English. Yeah. Because Dude, you got so like many. Go- I was surprised how many people in China spoke English. Yeah, because you got so many. One, over there, they take they just, they just they take English in, yeah. in school coming up. So the younger generation, they all speak English to some degree. But the basketball world in particular, because it's the sort of universal language, you got so many different nationalities potentially could be on one team, including coaches. Like I had one year, I had a coach. We had the Argentinian national team basketball coach was our coach. He didn't speak English and he didn't speak Italian. He only spoke Spanish. So you had literally have an interpreter. So we had like, like an interpreter there during you practice had, and you stuff. You have to have like three interpreters, like English, Italian, and I mean the rest of you know the rest of the guys. All the Italian guys spoke English. They spoke English for the most part, and I mean enough enough right? for basketball, yeah, they did, basketball yeah. terms. Exactly. Faster. Exactly. Passer. So I mean, like it, it was just crazy because we on that particular team, our our head coach didn't speak didn't speak English or Italian. He only spoke Spanish. We had a Russian guy on the team. We had a Serbian guy on the team. We had some Greek guys See, on the team. That's cool, though. It's awesome. Yeah, you get to be It's awesome. All, yeah, but there has to be sort of world. one common language in some kind of way, yeah, right? Yeah. you got to communicate in some kind of way. So ultimately, English was the, the main – even the, the front office folks and, the, you know, everybody sort of spoke English enough. So I got two, two more questions for you. Yep. The, lo- the Hawks. We got we – got re- I don't want to call it a rebuild anymore. Mm-hmm. I think, that, you know, they kind of got their pieces in position. Are the Hawks trying to just become a legit playoff contender? Or are they going for a championship? I, I think, I think every team is going to tell you they're going to they're trying to be a championship contender. Yeah, but I'm not buying that anymore. Now that I'm getting older, I'm starting to see like people are okay with just being like four or five consistently. Well, it's so difficult to to build a championship team too. Um, that you know, ultimately, that's always the the verbal goal, but not necessarily r- realistic. Um, that said. I think that Travis Slink coming from 
the Warriors culture um, in a time where he was part of the team that helped build that that group. That's just his ethos, kind of. I think I think that is instilled in him, and I think he's got the vision to do it. Um, and I think we've seen it unfold very quickly. Is he a machine all the time? He, he he's a very interesting guy. Like he's super quiet and introverted. Like he's a. He seems like he's a machine all the time. He's a, yeah, like he's, he's hard just, working all the time. He is. There's okay. no question. There's no question. He's a very. Like have very you ever seen him like sit down, drink a beer, and just be like, I'm not. I've doing never. Anything. Yeah, I've never seen him outside of some sort of work working environment. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, he's done. He's he's he put together a plan ahead of time, and he's executing the plan, which I think is rare. You don't see many teams do that. You might see teams blow it up and get rid of everybody and rebuild, but you don't really see a plan of how you're going to do it. Step by step, too. Exactly. Yeah. And he's he he put together. He he. Talked about what his plan was early on. Like none of the decisions and have been shocking. None, none. He's, like yeah, they said they're going to do this. Yeah, exactly. And he's he's put together. You know, he's put together an incredible young team. He we had another great draft this year. Um, that's going to continue to build. Um, I'm I'm not looking for anything flashy next off season either. Um, I think another this will be his third next uh, next draft will be his third draft in. He'll have a great young nucleus. He'll be able to probably go after some bigger some larger free agents next year to have a nice little core. And then the following year, I think, is the year you'll really see a splash because it should be a good, stable playoff team by then with a young core. And then they should be able to look at attracting some some high-level free agents really for the first time. I mean, I, the Kim, I mean, uh, Dominique Wilkins is the only, like, legit superstar this franchise has really ever seen in Atlanta. Um, Pistol Pete, maybe you could say, you know, previously, I guess, but – I would say Dominique is really the only, the only real elite player that's that's ever been here. Were you alive during Pistol Pete's career? I wasn't. Yeah, obviously. I think he was seventy. I was born in seventy-seven. Um, and I want to say his career was mid, early mid seventies. But he he still holds so. some team records, doesn't he? He does. Yeah, I mean, he was amazing. He was a three-point I mean, shooter. He was right? amazing, just amazing in general player. Um, but Dominique, you know. Arguably one of the best fifty players, like he, you know, incredible face of the franchise. Yeah, you that. can't ask for a better dude. You can't. Yeah, incredible guy, exactly. So you know who I was surprised how cool they were, Dikembe. Dikembe, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, because because yeah. you, you know, humor doesn't always translate well mm -hmm. to different cultures, nope. and especially sarcasm, especially yep. my sense of humor. Yeah, and either he was just nice to me and just like, all right, you little fat redneck kid, yeah. get away. Or he was just genuinely like yeah. that all the time, and I think he's genuinely. He like is that genuinely like that, but he's also a super smart guy, right? He didn't come to the United States to play to play yeah, basketball. He wanted to be a doctor. He came to be a doctor. Yeah. So he kind of fell into it, right? So he was already, you know, he was he was smart guy, like sharp, yeah, like true. well spoken. Um, so he had a different outlook, you know, kind of on things. Anyways, he, he's he's a a great he's a great guy, great person, great humanitarian, like obviously great player, but. He's a really, really good dude, too. So the lot, two, two things for you. Mm -hmm. They're both controversial questions, so I'll start Love with it. the least controversial. Okay. Who, was the, who did you hate playing against the most? Team or player? Player. Like, like, I, like to hear, like I, I like to hear the stories of Shaq and Yao Ming back yep. in the day yeah. where Shaq's like, man, I really hated the dude. But now, man, I respect the hell out of Yao Ming. So here's my problem. My problem was I was an undersized power forward, mm -hmm. really, in a time where – Carl Malone was still in the league. Anthony Mason was still in the league. Charles Oakley was still in the league. Like, there was big, just strong, bruising dudes in the league at that time. And obviously the game was played much differently 20 years ago, which yeah. is crazy to say, but, you know, my, I was drafted 20 years ago. Um, but just – I mean, I can't think of a time where there was – it was such – like an adversarial moment where there was one guy that I was all the time going up against, but I was always playing guys like that. And when you catch an elbow from Carl Malone yeah. or, you know, Anthony Mason, who – And you just have to take it. But, like, you, there's nothing, you know, like – You're going to square up on him? For one, you just got to hope you don't, you know, like get, get knocked out, yeah. you know, just from the sheer strength and stuff. Anyway, um, but just having day in and day out playing against guys like of that physical size and strength. So you strength, never took it personally? Nah, you can't. I mean, you know, some guys like, do. I mean, I guess you, I guess you, you, I guess some guys can, but nobody's out there trying to really physically hurt somebody. You think Shaq and Charles Barkley really hate each other? Nah. You think that's TV? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's some of the best TV yeah. there. Oh, that's great. And then the last thing I have for you, we uh -huh. both know Austin Walton just got married this last weekend. He did. He's, he's probably got about 10, 15 years on you younger. Yep. Can you beat him in one on one? I doubt it. 
I, I don't. I'm not putting myself up against many people. Uh, actually, I've never seen Austin play, so probably. I, what I'll, about Skills from Nappy Roots? I haven't seen him play either. So Skills says he can throw it down. Uh, can he? Yeah, and so, he's a big dude too. I I can still shoot. I can tell you that. Um, I, I would say I could probably still score enough. If you're gonna ask me to move a lot, that's when was the last time you shot happen. some hoops? I shoot fairly regularly. I got a hoop in my backyard and stuff like that. So I haven't played. There and play every I haven't played like in a pickup game in probably six or seven years. Five years, something like that. So I'll finish with the story. When I, I lived in China for a little bit before mm-hmm. um, I joined the Army, and I, I'm not a basketball player at all. Same physique now as, as then. But, dude, those little Chinese dudes would yeah. get terrified. When I would drive the lane, yeah. they would just – it was like this, the Red Sea. Just, Isn't that just funny? partying, man. Yeah, it's and funny. So, so uh, did you ever have anything like that where you were just like so – physically dominating it was just like this isn't even fun like in high school was it like so, that at all I, well so i went to a really small single a school in virginia i grew up right? in a really rural, rural area in in virginia um and so there weren't there wasn't anybody my size for one um, but i was also really skinny too um like i was super super thin have you seen that um, new kid that's like seven he's like 16 and he's like seven six or something uh, i haven't so he's got a physical. There's some some health wrong, yeah. health wise with him, yeah. Because he's super super skinny, yeah. Um, and that's what's scary because it's just like man, like you, like you, broken bones are real. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, there's no question. I mean, my senior year when I graduated high school, I was six ten, so same height I am right now. Um, but I weighed 195 pounds, and by the time I got drafted, I weighed 255, and was probably a good solid playing weight for me. For sure. Um, but 195, I wasn't physically able to play at Old Dominion when I first got there at 195 pounds. Too, too small? Like, yeah. Like, you just get you just, I just get pushed around. Like, there was nothing. nothing Because your do. center of gravity is so high. Yeah, That's it, does, it, doesn't, don't it doesn't take much to just kind of get nudged at that, you know, that light of weight. But playing, you know, you know, having my skill set and my size, playing in a really small, you know, school, it was pretty easy to, to dominate. I mean, you know, average – 28, 14, and 10, I think, my senior year. State player of the year, you know, all that. So Nice. Yeah. Well, that's all I got for you. Yeah. Thanks for coming Thanks on. for having me, man. It's great. You've been listening to Mind Your Business, Sports Music and Money, sponsored by SR Homes. Make sure you check them out at srhomes.com with residential communities throughout the metro area. Cal, thanks for coming in. Thanks for Alex, having me. Alex, we love you, and we're going to get Bill Connors in here. At SR Homes, our end goal is to create a home that's unique to you, one that you and your family will enjoy for years to come. With over four decades of home building experience, SR Homes has become a top home builder in Atlanta, offering a variety of communities in the most sought after locations. Locally owned and operated, SR Homes is a builder focused on you. For more information, visit us at srhomes.com.